Well, welcome everybody to the third uh, Search Mastery Interest Group Speaker Series event of the um, of the fall semester. This is our last event for for uh, 2023, and we're glad to we're glad to have you uh, here. Today we are talking um, with Brian McCann from U.com, who um, and his topic is NLP and the future of search with with U.com. And I'm just going to um, talk to you briefly about his about Brian's um, background. And Brian, we're really um, excited and happy to to have you and plan to share the recording of this um, really really um, broadly across our faculty and students and some of our other um, outreach programs. So everybody, Brian McCann is the co-founder and CTO of U.com. Previously, Brian was a lead researcher scientist at Salesforce Research, working on deep learning and its applications to natural language processing. He presented his work directly to customers on the keynote stage of Dreamforce on behalf of collaboration between Salesforce, Google, and Meta at the, at the PyTorch Developers Conference. As well as at a broad business facing as, as well as at broad business facing venues like VentureBeat Transform. Brian authored the first paper and holds the patent on contextualized word vectors, which eventually led to the transfer learning revolution in NLP with VERT and other transformer based architectures for contextualized word vectors. Other notable work includes early unified models for multitasking in NLP training the largest public and open source language model in the world in 2019 and applying language models to biology in which his team generated proteins that were synthesized by a lab and shown to be as or more effective than those in nature. His work has been cited thousands of times and he has spoken about the cutting edge of NLP and AI at research labs uh, around the world. Brian's work comes out of a deep philosophical interest in meaning and the desire to use AI to complement human creativity, inspire new thoughts, and ultimately develop tools for more fulfilling lives. He was a recipient of the first ever Eve Award at South by Southwest 2021 for his collaboration with award-winning and Netflix show writing author Daniel Kelman. He is a regular speaker on topics of literature and AI, poetry and AI, and other crossovers between AI and the arts. He's got an MS and a BS in computer science or artificial intelligence and a BA in philosophy at Stanford. And today he's going to talk to us about, um, about AI in search, which is um, putting together a lot, of the, a lot of the different things in his background and applying them in new ways. And Brian, we're really excited to have you here. This is a specialized interest of a number of people that are here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um... So I pull up my slides here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not very often that I get to talk to just like a dedicated group of people for for search and thinking about so much of this problem space. So this is this is great. I love it whenever I can find people in the world who care about some of these problems. And um, so this will be fun. I think uh, we'll we'll kind of talk about a little bit where the technology has been coming from. Uh, how search is changing now based on that. We're seeing a lot of change all at once um, based on the last several years of, of research and development. And then we'll also talk a little bit about where it's going. Uh, so with that, we can get started. Um, U.com, uh, that's where I am now. Uh, we're talking about NLP and the future of search. Uh, but first we're gonna talk about some of the lessons that uh, we've taken from a decade in AI research so that we can hopefully glean something from those in making some predictions about the future. Um, when I'm talking about NLP or natural language processing, uh, you know, I'm talking about AI, uh, mostly in my case, it was deep learning and neural networks uh, in all of my research um, applied to different kinds of natural languages, uh, like English. But really, as was mentioned in my bio, we started applying it to all sorts of things like sequences of amino acids, um, code, lots of different coding languages. And NLP has kind of become, uh, in my head, almost synonymous now as a skill set associated with just like processing sequences and understanding sequences of information, anything that we can encode into 
some sort of sequence of tokens, uh, we can use a lot of what we've learned from NLP uh, to understand things, generate new uh, new sequences, and maybe even interact with the physical world in pretty interesting ways. Uh, you know, you might think of uh, machine translation as like a classic example of natural language processing or classifying pieces of text as positive or negative, um, things like that. And a lot of search uses NLP. Um, why is it hard? Well, you know, uh, I, I, I came out of a uh, philosophy program trying to understand meaning and language is pretty much our main tool for understanding uh, the world. And it's, I, I would say, um, so everything that we can kind of know and understand uh, is captured in language in some form or another uh, over time. We, uh, we're constantly creating new language, right? When we interact with different phenomena and stuff. Um, so it's this ever changing process and and it's, it's a little lossy, you know, like sometimes the things that are in our heads um, uh, are hard to articulate, hard to get into language, um, but we want uh, AI and we want uh, the products we build to be able to understand us. So there's a lot of things we have to infer about people or about the world. Uh, we can try to gather as much as we can from context or given, but it still remains a very uh, ambiguous problem sometimes. And uh, we're gonna talk more and more about where it's headed, but uh, we've gotten a lot better at understanding people understanding these sequences of information and languages. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see kind of where we're going from there. Um, so uh, a lot of my research started out with this main idea. Uh, I was in a, a class on natural language processing and uh, computer vision before that and stuff. And it, the, the the way to do things um, was very much to gather a data set on a specific task, like machine translation, sentence classification, answering questions, um, and then build a model for that task and train it on that data. And the architecture for that model would be very kind of bespoke to that task. Um, it might have a lot of um, priors based on what people believe that was important in that task. and uh, I found this kind of odd uh, when I first started in AI, actually. I I was a little, uh, I don't know, I was kind of obsessed with this idea that we should have a single model uh, and we should be training it more to understand language and then have it learn what to do with that language and learn how to do things with language that we wanted it to do, like translate or, or what have you. Um, that way you weren't constantly trying to have a model, you know, relearn language from scratch for every single task it was trying to do, uh, it just seemed a little backwards to me. So when I was starting out, I was, I was pretty obsessed with this idea of having a single model uh, that was pre-trained in the sense that it was trained to just understand text or language. And then you could teach it how to do something specifically if you wanted to. Uh, when I started at Salesforce Research though, my first project was uh, exactly that, and uh, to be honest with you, I couldn't get it to work. Um, the data sets were not very well developed. Um, the, we didn't have a lot of key uh, insights we have today on the modeling side. Um, we didn't have the compute. It was, uh, none of the main pieces were there. Uh, the idea was there, but we couldn't get it to work. And so I ended up carving out a small piece of that project. And that's what became contextualized word vectors. Uh, because I couldn't get a model to do machine translation and question, question answering and summarization and text classification all together in a generative way, uh, instead I backed off and said, well, what if I could just establish one connection between you know, translation and classification or translation and question answering? And so that's what actually uh, led to contextualized word vectors, which was then very uh, popular uh, in the research community because there hadn't been a lot of development since word vectors, which uh, um, my co-founder, Richard, who's on this slide as well, um, was a big, uh, he was basically an early pioneer in word vectors. 
but this contextualized word vector process of actually starting to share models uh, on top of uh, words, things that actually understood things in context of a sentence was new. And uh, it, it, it had a lot of potential for sharing data. Uh, the transfer learning roles, results were really strong. So later Google would pick this up and uh, with their transformer models and have something called BERT. Um, but for me, this was just a, a stepping stone towards trying to figure out the broader question again of how to do as many things as we possibly could with a single model. Um, another way we used to frame it was as multitask learning, trying to learn how to do a lot of different things. And uh, we had this idea that uh, if we could fit things into a single model uh, and describe what we were doing in text and then allow the model to generate its answer, theoretically, you know, it should be able to do anything anything possible with language. Um, the architectures and the kind of modeling that was really well understood at the time was question answering. Uh, so we used a lot of pieces of question answering models and building this, but uh, the actual uh, neural network and everything that we made was, was closer to what we're using today in some ways. So in this, uh, natural language decathlon, as we called it, we picked the 10 hardest tasks that I could find in, in NLP. And uh, some of these involved answering questions over paragraphs from Wikipedia, involved translation, uh, summarization, writing some code in some sense, uh, translating things from English to uh, SQL, which was like a database querying language, um, and a bunch of others that are listed here. And the main thing we wanted to focus on was not having some hard coded way of telling the model which task it was supposed to do, but instead just asking it a question that informed how it should answer based on the context. So asking it to summarize something or asking a question of it or asking it to translate something, even given the same context would lead to different answers and different outputs. Um, it was also important that even when we were classifying sentences, like uh, in the example here about stirring funny and finally transporting reimagining of Beauty and the Beast, we weren't doing like a binary classification problem where we were predicting one or zero and then mapping that to positive or negative. In more of a generative way, we were selecting from the entire vocabulary that the model had and model learned that the word positive and the word negative were associated with these classes. So. This was really getting at that uh, that idea of learning how to use language first, learning how to use language to understand even what you should do, and then using language to actually do that thing. And as I was saying, the uh, the models looked uh, like a hybrid of a lot of like what we use today, which are more like transformer networks based on self attention and language modeling. Um, and what we kind of really knew how to do well at the time, which was question answering. Um, so we had uh, these sequences of tokens that you could um, input into the model, question and context, kind of describe what you're doing and then what you wanted to do that with. And then we would generate answers in a generative way uh, using like exactly what we use now, like a transformer based decoder. Um, this was, this was interesting for a few reasons. Uh, one, because I managed to fit my name into the acronym. Um, uh, MQAN is pronounced McCann, and I'm Brian McCann. And uh, that was always one of the best parts about the NLP community. I felt like we, we were OK with um, uh, kind of making some subtle jokes in our papers and things like that. We had a good <laughs> sense of humor. Um, and you know, then I got a lot of anonymous reviews coming in trying to publish this thing. Uh, if any of you are trying to publish papers, you might be familiar with some of these peer review processes. And uh, we kind of got destroyed. Um, this whole idea of trying to, you know, use a single model to handle all of natural language was considered misguided. Uh, the paper was overcrowded. Uh, if you look at some of the papers today, you know, they're hundreds of pages of long, hundreds of, hundreds of pages long, and uh, it would take a long time to read through all of them. 
this one was, you know, slightly longer than normal back then, but there was so much to put into it, right? All of these ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, people were very convinced that there just isn't such a thing as this general question answering, this general approach to uh, solving problems, not even for humans. Um, and they were certain. So we got rejected multiple times. Um, some of the reviews are are public, like at this conference, some of them are not they're just hidden in my email somewhere um but yeah everybody was uh, very sure that uh, this was not a good idea for a variety of reasons presenting at google things like that um you know the rooms were split 50 50 percent you know at the time i'd say even at the most advanced ai groups were like this is either a terrible idea or this is the idea um a year later though some of you might be familiar with a, a group called OpenAI. And uh, they had a paper come out uh, that's called Language Models or Unsupervised Multitask Learners. Um, a lot of people just call this the GPT-2 paper. If you're familiar with ChatGPT, um, you know, that's based on the GPT-3 and 4 models. Uh, GPT-2 was the one that came out um, for that. Uh, Alec Radford was a terrific researcher there and his team. Um, but they... Uh, they built off of this idea. So the, the main thing that um, they were trying to do with GPT-2 was in fact, based on that paper that was so heavily and so certainly rejected by most of the community um, and trying to approach NLP uh, with a unified kind of single model approach. Um, and casting everything in a way that uh, you didn't have to have all of your own biases and what you were you were trying to do. So GPT-2 came out. And um, the reason that I tell this story at the start is because it's going to, you'll see it kind of play out again and again. And I imagine we'll all see it play out again, not just with me, but with a lot of these bold ideas, right? When we're making bold predictions, um, a lot of them are counterintuitive to what people have seen in the past. Uh, the data doesn't always predict that, um, even though some of those things seemed obvious to me. Uh, you know, they weren't always obvious to most people. And uh, as long as you're working with great people and you keep going, uh, you can you can you can make more progress. So my co-founder and I um, took that. We uh, started building a bunch of language models for um, all sorts of domains and all these different problems and really diving into them in 2019. Um, but in 2020, we started seeing like, this was gonna be a, more than that. It was, this was a huge inflection point um, back in 2013 or so when I met my co-founder, we originally had been talking about search and uh, we wanted to do a lot with it, but had no idea how. So after seven years of research, trying to figure out how to make these unified models, how to understand people better with AI, we felt like it was finally time to get out in the wild and start a startup um, that could not just focus on making the technology better, but also influence how it would be used, um, make you know different business models around it, and really change uh, search and like what it means. Uh, since it, I do think, is still one of the highest impact applications of natural language processing, in some sense. How people find information had changed very little over 20 years. You know, Google is as good as it is at search and what it does. Um, it hadn't changed much, you know. Uh, there's It hadn't really learned how to do something differently, uh, even though it was good at what it was doing. And, and so U.com was born. Um, we started in 2020 in the summer and uh, launched our public beta in late 2021. So it took us about a year to build the foundations of a search engine, all of the things that go into understanding the web, um, also trying to bring as much of the new AI and deep learning stuff that uh, we had been doing into the foundations of U.com. And we were trying to push this idea of what a search engine was to be more like a do engine, um, going from just search to helping people get things done. 
Uh, this is kind of a line uh, of thinking. And I think Jim, we've seen several times uh, companies come out with, um, but moving from say search uh, conversations into like actually acting on those things and doing things for people has been been part of what we were trying to do, even with that deck NLP model, the, the McCann model, you know, we were trying to get it to not just understand, uh, do things like question answering, information retrieval in some sense, broadly speaking, but actually like write those those queries and execute on a database. Um, so we wanted it to do things. In the early days, this looked more like, you know, trying to surface more and more information um, from websites like Stack Overflow, uh, bringing code snippets out for developers, adding copy paste buttons, anything that we could do to save people time and make the search results more actionable and useful for people. Um, and, and shortly after we launched with that starter search engine base, we started adding more and more generative AI into the mix uh, to make it more of a do engine. So in the beginning of 2022, you know, we started looking at queries that weren't best served by, let's say, traditional search approaches where you weren't going to find the answer um, on the internet somewhere. And looking at applications we could build so that instead of just, you know, pulling up an article about how to get past writer's block, we could bring in a generative AI tool to help you with your writer's block and actually write with you. Um, in my bio I mentioned, you know, working with authors and, and show writers and things like that to help creativity. And this was this was this was part of that, right? Like bringing that into the mix. And, you know, if someone's asking about how to write well or they're stuck on some history essay or whatever it is, uh, they can actually use generative AI to write with them. So this was you, right? And then we uh, started expanding on this to say, well, what about all of the times that people can't find the answer to their coding questions? What if we have these models start to write code for them? So we started writing code for people in all sorts of different languages. Uh, what if the images you're looking for aren't, aren't out there? So, you know, we can't retrieve them from anywhere. You want something new. Okay, so we invented uh, you imagine and had this uh, image generation uh, to you.com as well. And we still had some of the core problems of understanding user intents, understanding the query and like which queries, you know, were best suited to something like you imagine and you write and you code. Um, but we weren't necessarily working with like a, an index in, in like the traditional way. Um, this is San Francisco, not, not yesterday, I can, I can say, uh, but it's still pretty nice. Um, it was in late 2022 uh, that generative AI started really taking off. And um, as we had these pieces in u.com already, it was really uh, easy for us to bring in a conversational flow uh, for u.com. So we introduced uChat uh, in this line of kind of generative AI tools. And this was uh, on the front page with our search results so that you could just start chatting with the language model uh, underneath, but the language model was also making use of the search results that we had access to. So ever since then, you know, you could start asking uh, anything you wanted of this language model. And we've been focusing on uh, a lot of the different, different problems that come from that. So um, once you give an LLM access to the internet, and you have this conversational interface, it unlocks a few things. The conversational part, I see as an extension of that idea from like contextualized word vectors um, back then. Like the more and more context we're able to pack into these models, um, the more we're able to understand what people actually mean. And you'll see that pattern come up, you know, in, in the later slides as well. So all of a sudden we were able to answer way more complex queries um, we could give these really up-to-date answers for language models. And we started working on citations as well to, to build trust. And um, yeah, this is this was essentially a huge part of, of the year for us and a lot of the AI community, trying to uh, keep language models up to date, even if they're not their training sets are have like some cutoff, uh, trying to prevent them from hallucinating answers to questions. Hallucination is kind of this dual flip 
of you know the generative process um and you kind of you want it in some situations right like writing an essay about something um or writing like a fictional story um but you don't want it in, in other cases where you need some parts of your essay to be like very grounded in reality um and they weren't very good at reasoning about math and science and logic and things like that um it just wasn't uh it wasn't obvious how to get them to do that. So on the first problem, you know, when we started uh, with UChat, ChatGPT and other kind of conversational interfaces weren't connected to a search engine. So as soon as their data sets cut off in September, 2021, back in the day, I think it's like September, 2023 now, but this problem will continue that you train it up to a certain point. And what you really want is to have it connected into a search engine these things that uh, we've worked on for so long, right? So that you can pull in search results and the language model can use those search results, even if it doesn't know it inherently in whatever metaphorical way you want to interpret that word. Because it wasn't trained on that, doesn't know it, but it kind of knows to then learn to use this new context, uh, the search results from, from you.com. And you can see that this was kind of the key to unlocking um, citations uh, for our model, actually being able to like cite our sources, which might be useful for some of you. You go from not knowing anything about the news at all to knowing the latest things that are going on um, and being able to actually point to where you're getting your information from all automatically. With hallucination, we found that it wasn't just in text, but uh, some things are just easier for humans to understand uh, if there's like visual components or um, multimodal components of you know, different varieties. Um, so we started adding in the applications that we normally saw in search um, also into our conversational flow, adding these in as like additional tools that uh, u.com could use. And so, you know, if you're searching for something like the Salesforce stock, you don't really need like a giant essay on what Salesforce is and then have it hallucinate what the price is and things like that. We can just fall back to you know these multimodal outputs, um, very dense piece of information. And more and more, we're teaching the language models how to actually interact with this and um, control this you know application for us and do things for us so we can, again, talk to it in natural language and have it use maybe an application like this, just like a normal search engine. Um, and that brings us to this last one, you know, reasoning about math, science, logic. Uh, I think a year ago, especially, you know, LLMs were not good at and were not th thought of being good at uh, these like system two type types of thinking. And if you're familiar with thinking fast and slow from uh, Professor Kahneman, you know, there's like system one, there's more of this intuitive pattern recognition approach, there's system two. And I think, you know, over time, me working with AI and, and language models, there's there's everything in between as well, right? Um, and really to get the systems that we want, they have to be able to blend these things together. But they were really not good at these like system two type problems. And it was really easy to see that. Um, so we started working on something we call an agent. Um, it's not really, uh, it's, it's really focused on the doing part, going back to like the do engine. So this is a language model that understands language, builds off that, but is really focused on doing things for you. That's why we use the word agent, because it has this like, uh, you know, it's supposed to be acting on your behalf in some sense. So we were writing code before with you code, we would generate code using language models. But with the agent, we actually gave it access to a machine, a computer, so it could run Python code. Now we're, just, we're writing the code, we run it on a computer, and then it can even take further action based on those things. It can write more code, it can debug things uh, to kind of fix its code if it doesn't work. Uh, those are some of my favorite examples where it writes it, it doesn't work, it gets an error, goes back, it rereads its code, changes something. Uh, and there's a ongoing work at u.com and like enabling it to use more and more uh, libraries that are open source and accessible. 
Um, and this really unlocked, you know, answering complex STEM questions, uh, anything that involves this like very specific kind of reasoning um, where you can kind of get it from the context, but the best thing to do would be to essentially compute it in some way. And language models weren't good at that, but checking out this video, you know, see it actually writing the code in real time. And uh, sure enough, it's the right answer. Whereas before, it certainly would not have. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of a bonus shortcoming as well, because uh, after we tackled these three, you know, now we're getting into the territory of like, okay, well, what's what's coming next? Well, in October, we launched personalization. And this has been a really interesting part of search and understanding and all these things. Uh, now that we have a much better understanding of context using the web, using search results, we have language models that can understand user queries and get this conversational flow going to even like ask follow-up questions and gather additional context. Well, there's this personalized context, right? So we can add in information about you um, based on how you're querying, based on what you want to put into your profile. Uh, so if you like hiking or something like that, and you put that in your profile, uh, for personalization. Now, when you ask what is going on this weekend or something like that, um, you can get customized, personalized answers. So for me, like when I ask what, what should I do this weekend? It knows that I'm in the Bay area. It knows that I like art. It knows that I like nature. It knows that, uh, I'm an AI researcher. And so like, if it can find, um, AI events, it knows that I'm a CTO. So it knows that like, what to look for for me and that's uh that's like an extra dimension there that is unfolding as we um really really can understand people better so um now that we've kind of talked about those the shortcomings uh i kind of wanted to pose a question that's fairly relevant to this group which is like is this even a search engine anymore i, I don't know if this is like the the, the right term um, there's definitely a search engine. Search is the foundation, right? Um, and we talked a little bit about like a do engine towards the beginning. Um, more and more of these things are looking like assistants of some kind, like an AI assistant, uh, an AI agent, but really jumping back, like th this is kind of a fascinating problem, right? Like I, I don't think we even know entirely what we should call these things yet. Um, some people are aiming for ATI and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're seeing humanity in some ways, like come up with new language to deal with these different concepts and uh, search is the forefront of this, right? Like it's been the motivating problem. It is the problem. Um, so it's, it remains the kind of most impactful area for natural language processing and AI uh, to continue to develop. Um, how we get to information has just been uh, a huge driving problem. But for us, we are conceptualizing it as, you know, trying to build an AI system that does more for you. Um, so instead of just calling it like a do engine or something, like really try to get it to understand the world, understand you, and work work for you in these ways. Um, and just summing up some of this stuff, you know, uh, this year has led to a lot of growth in this area. Um, our AI assistance, chat, search. Um, we're adding some additional things like UAgent uh, that we're calling chat modes, like deep research and um, different kinds of things like that. So you should look out for those in e.com where it's going to be able to use new tools in its searches. It can like use search engine multiple times, for example, and then go look at those websites and come back and summarize things for you and make tables for you and do all sorts of things. Uh, so what search is continues to change. And I would say, even though, you know, the, the world is kind of saying, mm -hmm, things are moving very quickly and there's a lot of invention and innovation going on. 
Um, we're still, from my perspective, from inside you.com, it looks like the beginning still. There's just so much more um, that all of us can explore and work on. And as part of that, uh, I started uh, an effort to basically start having the key pieces of our technology released um, in a form of like an API so that anybody else can use it. So if you wanted to query, for example, our web index, that was useful for something that you were doing. Um, if you wanted to build a language model, if you wanted to build your own chatbots or assistants, whatever you're trying to do, uh, more and more of our core tech, we are releasing for people to experiment with because the future, yeah, it's really wide open. Um, we have our web search endpoint that you can use and play around with. I would actually love some feedback on that. You know, if you're seeing gaps in it, um, or crawling the web, we're trying to understand the whole web and this web search endpoint you can use to, um, you know, replace, uh, you know, Google or Bing or something like that an application. There's news. Um, so we're trying to keep up to date with all the latest news. And we have something called like our RAG endpoint. RAG stands for retrieval augmented generation. Um, so if you're generating with a large language model and you want to augment that language model with a retrieval method, um, like search, um, all of you.com is basically an implementation of retrieval augmented generation in that sense. So we have an endpoint that does all of that as well. Um, our LLM combined with our, our news endpoint combined with our search endpoint. And so you can get all the benefits of like the grounding, more factual accuracy, less uh, hallucinations and stuff like that. Um, in our RAG endpoint, you can just try it out. So there's you.com and you can play with the application and, and try to use that as a daily driver or you, know, you can actually start building yourself uh, using some of the things that we've done and build on top. Um, and it's kind of interesting because these technologies, if you start building them the way we have for specifically for language models and with this direction of like an AI assistant, you can do a lot better than, you know, Google being some of the much larger, uh, search engines with a lot more, you know, capital behind them. They're huge companies, tons of people. If you have this additional context, if you just change the paradigm a little bit, uh, assume LLMs are in the mix, you can, you can do a lot better on, on search itself. So the way we build the index, even if we have pieces that are inverted into an in, in inverted index, if we have vector index, like incorporating language models and everything that we've learned from AI into the entire process end to end, uh, can lead to some pretty astounding results. So do you keep an eye on that part as well and try to, um, yeah, keep up to date. Hey, hey Brian, could you, um, just this, I don't know if others in the group are, um, have the same question I do here, but the concept yeah. of recall, could you explain the concept of recall a little bit more, please, so that we understand what this means? Yeah, 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 great question. So yeah. the recall here is basically looking at um, when you put in a query, like if a user has a query, the recall we're looking at here is saying, based on the the, the snippets, the pieces of text that we go out on the web and we get and retrieve. Uh, let's say we get the top 50 or whatever it is, top 100 or top 1,000. Then uh, you get a recall number based on um, whether the answer is in those, um, those retrieved snippets, we call them. So that doesn't mean the language model is actually going to use that answer or find that answer within those snippets. Um, that's the that's the different metric that we have, um, and you see similar results. But the recall one in particular is is kind of the closest to the traditional search type metric, where it's like, can I give you the documents that have the answer in them, and then the language model can use that uh, to actually provide the right answer. So when we're saying that e.com's recall is better, it means when a query comes in we're more likely to surface the right information, the right documents to cite, to source, uh, that are the most recent, the most relevant, um, even compared to traditional search engines. Yeah. Great, thanks. And then these, um, and then those four different 
uh, those are different types. Oh of, yeah, um, these are yeah. different data sets. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, data sets. Okay. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. So the fresh QA, hop, hop, hot QA, squad V2, MS Marco. These are the first four. We're adding a lot more actually for different domains, but these are question answering data sets. Uh, most of them. So QA standing for question answering. And every example that comes from these typically has like a question, an answer, like humans have gone and they've decided this is the answer. And then a lot of these come with uh, context as well. So squad is question and answers over Wikipedia. And then it gives you the paragraph that the answer is in. That's how, that's how people normally do squad. But in this setup, we don't we don't give it that paragraph, right? We just give it the question. And then our API has to go find out where the right answer is. And that's where the recall comes in. We go, we do act, actually like quite accurately find the right paragraph on the web, um, bring it in, and then uh, answer based on that. Hotplot QA is the same. It's not Wikipedia uh, alone, but it's a bunch of question answer pairs, a bunch of documents that normally have the answer in them. Um, but we don't use any of those documents. We say, you got to go find it, you.com, and good luck. Uh, so yeah, that's that's all of these work. Any follow-up okay. question on that? Not for me, no. Yeah, so in summary, you know, I think uh, check this out. Um, search is changing a lot. It's still changing a ton. Everything that like I'm seeing from inside you.com, like the very words we're using to describe search um, are changing and the vocabulary is changing more than I've ever seen in the last ever. Uh, so it's a super exciting space. Uh, I'm really glad that I get to chat with, you know, a group of people who care so much about it. Um, you can keep an eye on us and you can build with us too. Um, you know, the APIs are out there. Uh, so I'll leave it there and I think uh, we'll probably have some time for questions too, if people have some. Um, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, glad to be here. Ooh, okay. I see you thank you. Let's, um, let, let's see uh, if, if people have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I know there's one already and I will go ahead and um, ask that. And then I have, then I have, um, one or two as well, but um, th th this first question is when submitting a query and receiving an, uh, to AI and receiving an unsatisfactory answer, would you recommend adding information to the query so that the the um, AI can adapt, completely rephrase the question or what's your um, what's your thinking on, on uh, refining your prompts? Yeah, yeah, um, it's a great question. So, um, when I'm doing it, um, I do typically try to, I try to keep in mind to some extent, like at least the degree to which I understand how these things are working. So context is really important. And I do think adding, adding additional information or adding additional context, something that like tries to clarify the query, um, can go a long way. Sometimes that can involve rephrasing as well, but, um, I do think adding context can can go a long way, you know, and and from our side, you know, every time someone types something in, um, we do try to like write out different, uh, we call it like rewriting, right? So we try to rephrase questions and find similar questions or similar queries and add as much context as we can. So just based on those automated processes, like I, I would say as a human using them, I do the same thing. Um, my prompts now, sometimes, you know, they're super long. Um, it feels almost like a craft to some extent when I'm using like a conversational interface like this. And I would also make use of, you know, follow-up questions and, uh, the conversational flow to build those things in as well. So yeah, they're not perfect. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but I would, I would add as much as you possibly can and, almost like you're talking to a person, you know, if they don't get it and try to clarify. Um, in, in terms of the big picture of where um, 
I guess what I guess what what's in the back of my mind is how, how relative is there's so there are lots of things that these new tools that that you dot com for example can do that the traditional search engines don't and can is there is there like a sweet spot for the types of for, for the types of um, applications and and uses is there is it better is it can you use it for, do you recommend using it for everything? I, I'm thinking of, um, currently I'm thinking about validation of information and where the sources, how we can know what the sources are and whether um, you you think that there's gonna be a build out in the, um, in the uh, transparency of where the answers come from. You're talking to, some of us are, um, you know, are either in the information space or the library space or, you know, the information validation and all that kind of, th those kinds of questions are, um, come up a lot when it comes to um, these tools. So maybe you could just talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the validation process and continuing to uh, like ground LLMs in like what's actually happening in the world or, 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 or various sources ongoing problem um and, and a really really hard one because it almost has it's almost orthogonal to um like the the pre-training process that I was talking about at the beginning right this pre-training of just like oh try to understand language it has nothing to do with kind of deciding which pieces of information are the right pieces of information it's just like become fluent you know in English or whatever it is but actually representing um what you want uh, the language model to kind of think or represent to other other people, other users, and and trying to validate the information, um, it usually comes after. And so there are these um, alignment processes and and a bunch of things that happen that uh, I I don't think people fully you know have it solved at all. Um, I think like there's also pieces uh you know like library sciences right like there's 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 information out there that uh, is still very hard to even access in these ways um in the way that like u.com does so um it's going to be really important i think to maintain some sense of like uh like final authority or something like that um in in the human uh to some extent until um we until we figure a lot of those problems out you know they're getting better but as you said like transparency on those things it's just going to be like a trust building process i think over a long time and uh people will get more and more used to it um there even when we first started you know we were trying to convince people to use u.com instead of google and sometimes People would type something into you.com, they wouldn't get the right answer. And they'd be like, oh, Google, Google would have got that. And then I would go try it on Google and Google wouldn't get that. <laughs> but people would assume that it would, um, or that it would have been better or faster, or they type in their query and they kind of assume that if they don't get what they want, uh, that that they did something wrong. Um, Google like built a very impressive level of trust with people, even though it wasn't always right. Uh, it wasn't always like validated. Um, and I, I think that level is where we're not really near that on the on the new uh, AI side of things. Um, but I do expect that to kind of be developed over time. Yeah, that's it. That's, I mean, there's a lot of, it seems, seems like there's a lot of opportunity to develop um, processes it you know in the in the information validation space of how you interact with the how you interact with these kind of tools because it can generate a lot, a lot of ideas and then the, the validation process is just another step that can either be yeah. um, supported by u.com as a different yeah. aspect of the tool yeah or, yeah. Uh, I, yeah and on the validation uh one other thing like the the cases that i've seen it be really, really useful already are, are in those cases where you can quickly iterate and validate, right? So something like writing code, does the code work or not? You can kind of find out very quickly. It's yeah. not that hard. Um, 
it was 100% possible, but time, it took a lot of time and cost to figure out if like proteins worked when they wrote out proteins, right? But you still get to a point where it's like, did this protein work or not? And anytime you get that kind of thing, um, the faster you can validate it, the better. Uh, yeah, it's or still even, hard even... sometimes with like news and things, right? Because there's so much going on all at the same time that it's not clear which one should be considered correct. Because there's not, it's not, it's not the same as right, right, running code and saying like, oh, it didn't work. Uh, so yeah. All right, we have something in the chat here. And she says, there have been issues identifying terrorists for the no-fly list because there are different ways to transliterate surnames from the countries these folks come from. Can AI address this? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, transliteration, you know, it's definitely something I, I, I think can help with um, across the board for, for various applications. Um, so I suppose so. Um, yeah, transliteration, you know, kind of going from speech to text to speech and things like that, I think are more and more, uh, they're getting closer and closer to being, um, solve problems for things like English. Um, but I think where you'll still see the most issues is when like we don't have a lot of data, uh, for lower resource languages. As, as people call them. That's always been an issue um, ever since I started and well before that, that it's all it's all based on data, right? And so if you have languages that we don't have a lot of information online, you know, in that language, can't collect as much data and you can learn quite a bit from similar languages, but the further the language is to some extent um, from English, Romance languages, uh, some of the bigger languages in the world, um, the harder that problem is going to be. Um, even models like for Chinese and stuff, they they need like vast amounts of you know Chinese compared to learning from English. It doesn't help as much. It's not as much transfer. You see what she's saying there? She's trying to clarify. I mean, transliterating from a from a language with a different script. Yeah. To yeah. a Rome to Roman alphabet. Yeah, it's 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 I'm sure it could. Um I think um parts of that, you know, also that makes that challenging. So I, I think I think it should. AI is like a perfect tool for something like this, um, uh, any sort of transliteration like that. Um, but I imagine some of the way that we like tokenize these different words and languages, um, yeah, it's just gonna require quite a bit of uh, data on that problem, I suppose. I'm not, I'm actually not super familiar with, um, say transliteration data sets. I don't know how much of that is like really out there. But I think it's I a good a, for AI. Yeah, I, I have a privacy related question. And this okay. has to do with the personalization that you that you um, talked mm -hmm. about it as the feature. Are you incorporating the, that data into the models? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So the data is used. Um, so so first of all, you know, uh, that data is basically something that like you can fill out in a profile, and um, you know, you'll even see sometimes we'll we'll kind of ask like if you want us to add certain things to a profile for you, um, and based on that profile, um, that's what the model works with. So it's similar to how we show the language model search results. Um, it's not really trained on those search results. It just can see them at the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like know them. It's not part of its like training data, if that makes sense. So it doesn't get 
into the model so it can't leak to okay. other people or things like that, but it can kind of reference that when it's answering. Okay. I asked this question as an open source investigator. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for ways. <laughs> I'm looking for ways to find this stuff. Um, yeah. so, but that's a whole different topic. Totally. Um, yeah. So I think we're we're getting um, close to the end of time, and I don't see any other questions. Is there any uh, closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with, Brian? This has been really really great. Yeah. Hopefully, it's been it's been interesting to just get some of these uh, concepts out there. I think to like I said, folks folks like you that are in this in this field and and in this area, um, things are changing more than ever and faster than ever, and uh, it's really exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited for all of you to kind of go through that, um, and probably have to deal with a bunch of hard questions that come up. Um, but it's opening up a lot of avenues for us to solve some problems that we've been working on for a long time, right. Um, in very different ways and, um, even get better results. So, um, yeah, best of luck, I guess, uh, good luck to you and feel free to reach out to me um, wherever, wherever I am, uh, if you'd like to, so we can continue the conversation. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Thank you, Brian. We really enjoyed this. And I want to thank, um, I want to thank everybody who, who, um, attended today and heard this and heard this, um, great talk. This is the last of our speaker series for 20, um, 23, and we will reconvene again in February. And Brian, I hope we can, um, keep track of you and maybe you can come back and talk to us again the next time you have, um, you have something something new to to tell us about you.com that'd be great i'd love to yeah. all right great thank you so much